Hello, good morning and welcome to this special Google Hangout. We're broadcasting live from the U.S. Consulate General here in Lagos, Nigeria, and I'm Olua Sheonpi, compare and radio host at 99.3 Nigeria Info. It's such an honor and delight to be here with Patrick, Claire, and Katrina, and uh, they are American consular officers here at the U.S. Consulate General. And today we want to talk about basically the U.S. visa application process and all that has to do with applying for a visa, getting a visa, and um, going on a trip to the U.S. So good morning, guys. Good, good morning. morning. It's good to be here. And I'd like to say on, um, on behalf of, the, uh, of Nigeria and um, you know, people who are watching in diaspora, we say thank you to um, the consul, uh, consulate management, uh, to the acting U.S. Uh, consul general, Dihab Gibreab. I always struggle with her surname. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. So we say a big thank you to her and the rest of the management for uh, creating this platform uh, for Nigerians to ask questions and uh, for us to uh, dispel some of the myths and misconceptions that are um, attached to applying for a U.S. visa and uh, all whatnot. All right, so just some basic information. We want to deal with, um, as I've said, U.S. visa applications. We might not be able to answer um, specific questions that relate to specific visa application processes. So if you recognize Claire or Katrina and, um, and you didn't get a visa and you have a particular um, grievance, this might not be the, <laughs> the <laughs> platform uh, for the expression of that grievance or the might not be able to address those questions. But if there are any other general uh, questions, we would love to take them. We'd also like to let you know that um, you can send questions in. If you look at the top right corner of your screen, uh, you would see something that looks like this. If you click on it, a little uh, box will come up and you can uh, send your questions. We're going to see the questions live here and we're going to take questions. Now, we might not be able to take all the questions. Uh, what we'll do is we'll sift through and pick questions that we believe uh, represent, uh, you know, what some of the other questions might be, all right? So um, just thought to set some ground rules uh, there for us. All right, so where do we start? I think it would be nice to get to meet you guys. Patrick, Claire, and Katrina, I've had the opportunity to meet you guys already, and uh, we've, uh, you know, had a chat. But for those watching now, um, where do we start? I think ladies first, right? Sure. <laughs> Katrina, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, like Shane said, my name is Katrina. Um, I'm originally from Michigan and the United States, and uh, I do non-immigrant and immigrant visas here at the consulate, and I've been in Nigeria for almost two years now. Okay, yeah. okay. Have you had a goosey soup yet, and uh, Amala? Uh, yes. Okay. You know, I uh, I would consider myself a foodie. I love trying new and different foods, so I have tried as many different Nigerian dishes as I can take. And what is um, your favorite? I would say my favorite is pepper soup. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I like fish pepper soup, mm. goat pepper soup. I could do that all day. Um, <laughs> I, I do, I, I do. That's probably my favorite. Yeah. That's good, that's good. All right, Claire. Uh, my name is Claire. I have been in Nigeria only for one month now, so Ooh. I'm one of the newer officers. Before this, I was in Muscat, Oman, on the Arabian Peninsula, so a little different. Uh, I'm excited to be here, and I have not had the chance to try pepper soup yet, but I am a big <laughs> fan of pounded yam. Ooh, okay, yeah. okay. So that's been uh, my new discovery. Katrina, please, you need to suck this up, man. She needs to have some pepper soup. <laughs> oh, we'll make sure that she tries everything, right? That's yeah. Good. Yes. That's good, that's good. That's good. All right, um, Patrick, yeah. it seems like we've talked about just food. Yeah. I'm sure there's more, there's more beyond food. definitely more. I'm trying more, to say yeah. something interesting about myself. We don't have to keep talking about, about food. food. All right, all right. So, Patrick? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, you know, we're glad to be here, too. Patrick, I'm an Patrick, this is very lovely and awesome wife. Oh, my God, okay. Yeah. She lives here. She lives, she lives here. here. Okay, so tell us. So uh, first of all, uh, welcome everybody, and I'm, we're, we're glad to be here to answer your visa-related questions. Uh, my name is Patrick, as Shun P said. Uh, I've been in Nigeria here with uh, my wife and two pet cats since uh, December. <laughs> so I'm nine months old now and okay. really liking it. Okay. Um, I've lived previously in a few sub-Saharan African, African countries, and I uh, have to say I find Nigeria to be extremely complex and dynamic. I'm, I really mm. like it here so mm. far. Mm. Extremely complex and dynamic. I, I love, I love that. Oh, someone once said one of the best ways to describe Nigeria is organized chaos. Mm. I don't know if you guys, have, if you guys have seen that. It's, it's, it's beauty in the, sure. in the, you know, in the, you know, vibrancy and sure. life and everything. And so you're welcome. Welcome to the Thank complex 
niceness that is Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get on with it. Um, I think for me, the I would like to, I would like for us to start off with what you guys think is the uh, most important myth that needs to be dispelled when it comes to sure. uh, visa applications, uh, you know, here. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, for me, I think the biggest myth out there is the more documents the have, you have, the more likely we are to believe you, um, or the more likely we are to give you a visa. And I think that in the non-immigrant visa process, so if you're going for a visit, if you're going to be a student, it's really important to know that we're, as visa officers, we're focusing on the interview and what you say, uh, the questions we ask, your response, um, and so when you come with a big packet, we we don't necessarily need to look at that. Um, and so it's very important, I think, for me, that's the biggest myth. Uh, it, sure. Focus on the interview, on answering our questions, uh, and don't be so worried about shuffling in that folder uh, and getting the right paper out. I think this is, this is mind-blowing because even I thought, the first time I, I came here to get a visa, I thought I needed to come with a lot of documents. But it occurred to me that I didn't have to show anything. Right. Yeah. And um, I think that sometimes if you talk to people who are going on the immigrant visa side, mm -hmm. so are going permanently to the United States, mm -hmm. which we won't focus so much on here, that is a very document heavy process. So there are people that go to the U.S. Embassy that need a lot of documentation. Mm -hmm. But if you're going for a temporary visit to be a student, then very minimal documentation Just needed. To just to follow up on Claire's point, I would agree that that's one of the biggest myths. And really, for the vast majority of people that are coming in for a visa interview, these are your the people who are coming for a visiting visa. Really, all we need to see in the end is your Nigerian passport, your appointment confirmation sheet. It can also be important to bring in your old Nigerian passports. Um, that can show some of your travel history and things like that. Um, for students, we also uh, we do need to see a little bit more, and that's the what's called an I-20 form that's issued by their respective school. And we also need to see a receipt for what's called a SEVIS payment. Mm. Um, this, and SEVIS is a system that, that helps to maintain the kind of um, foreign student system in the United States. Okay, um, before I go on to the other question, on this SEVIS payment receipt, that's mm -hmm. the only form of payment that people seeking uh, student visas need to pay before applying for the visa. Would, would they need to pay some form of deposit for school fees? before applying to the visa, is that a requirement? No, for the uh, application, when you come in for your visa interview as a student, the only fees you will have need to have paid at that point is the normal 160 US dollars for the application, and then the extra 200 US dollars for a student application, mm. um, and the service uh, fee payment that Patrick has mentioned. Um, paying tuition for the school or any other type of extraneous fees are not required at the time of your interview. All right, okay, so back to the document uh, uh, discussion. I, I think that's really profound, and I'm glad that we started on, on this. Um, so the question for me then is, if people don't need to show documents um, to prove that, you know, um, you know, to you know, prove any point, then how do you guys accept, uh, assess every applicant? Sure. How are you able to then, you know, properly assess an applicant and then tell, you know, who's, who's um, fit to get a visa or not? That's a really good question, Shun. I'm glad you've asked it. Um, really, again, going back to this documents thing, we don't need to so see so many documents. And really what we're looking at is the contents of someone's application, the content of the interview that a person has with the consular officer. And we're also uh, taking those into consideration under uh, US immigration law and the requirements that need to be met uh, for someone to, be, to, to receive a non-immigrant visa or any other type of visa for that matter. Um, so this, again, going back to this idea that uh, about the need for documents, we, we really do not need to see so many documents. So if you, if you fill your form well, truthfully, and you know, you have very good intent to travel and you have all the requirements as stipulated by um, the U.S. law, and I want to believe all of this is available on, on the website yes. that sure. people go on to do yeah. registration. Absolutely. Um, and just, just again, for the benefit of those who might not um, know what, what this website is. Uh, do you want to tell us where people can go to get information on filling the form? Because from what I hear, you need to pay more attention to filling the form sure. mm -hmm. than putting documents together. Yeah. Uh, the All the information you need about applying for a non-immigrant immigrant visa can be found on our website, and that is nigeria.usembassy.gov. 
Uh, we've created a link to it in the showcases uh, part of the Google platform. You can find it over on the, uh, I guess, the left-hand side of the screen. Okay. That's where you can get all your information. Um, if you do submit an application for a visa, you'll be redirected to another site. It's called uh, ustraveldocs.com slash ng. We've also included a link uh, on the left-hand side of the platform in the showcases feature. So you can find all the information you need to apply for a visa at, at either of those two links. Fantastic. All right, so we, we uh, have seen some questions coming. As I said earlier, if you want to ask a question, in the top right corner of your screen, you see something like this, just click on it, and uh, you'll be able to ask your question. We'll get to the questions in a short while. Um, but um, just just looking, that's so we talked about documents. That's the most important way to read this well. But let's go to the basics. Mm -hmm. What is a U.S. visa, <laughs> and um, what is how would someone? I know we've talked about the website already, but what is a U.S. visa, and um, how can one apply for a U.S. visa? Sure. Um, yeah, I think back to basics is always good. <laughs> and speaking of myths, that's another myth I think that people may have. A visa isn't permission to enter the United States. It's permission to begin the entrance process. So mm -hmm. Patrick uh, has this great saying, it's like being able to knock on the door. The people Doesn't mean the door will be open. Exactly. <laughs> the people in charge of opening the door are our lovely colleagues at the um, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, as we call them. Uh, they're going to ask you the same questions or similar questions that we've asked you as visa officers. They're also, it's important to note, the people who tell you how long you're eligible to stay in the United States. So we give you a visa, permission to knock on the door, for two years. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean you can stay in the U.S. in status, meaning legally, for two years. Mm -hmm. So CBP, again, are the people that determine those two things. Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking, all right, this, this is not really good to hear. So the fact that I get a visa means I can get turned back at the door, you know. So um, let, let's address that as well. What are sure. the chances that someone with a visa will get turned back? Or under what circumstances? Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the biggest um, reasons for something like that, and again, this is this is rare. For the vast majority of people, it's not something they need to be very worried about. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest issues that um, can lead to a, a turnaround, so to speak, is if if you know, because we we type notes when we do interviews, and if someone from U.S. Customs and Border Protection sees, for example, that someone has told the visa officer X. But then they arrive at the border and they're saying something totally different. That can really diminish the credibility of the person who is, in a sense, as Claire said, knocking on the door to enter. Mm -hmm. And that can cause problems. Mm -hmm. um, and they may ask additional questions about that. And again, they, they always have the right, um, you know, per their mandate to protect U.S. borders to, in a sense, turn around someone. But that is, that is very rare. Okay. And I, I do want to just to piggyback on that a little bit. We're talking a big difference, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you said right. to us, I want to go for 10 days and you show up to CBP and you say, I want to stay for 11. That is not what we're <laughs> discussing here. We're okay. talking about showing up at the border as a student and saying, oh, yes, I want to go work at General Electric in mm. New York, mm. sure. because that is not a valid use of the visa that we have granted you. Mm. Mm. Um, and also CBP has a very good uh, website that you can look okay. at information specific to entrance. Okay. And just to reiterate again, this is not something that the vast majority of our applicants should worry about. The entering at customs when you arrive in the United States, it really is a routine um, procedure. A procedure that you do have to do to enter the United States, but it's nothing to, to be afraid of. It'll yeah. be very basic questions, very similar to the ones that you uh, had at your interview. All right, I think I think we should also um, talk again about the difference between a, an immigrant visa and a non-immigrant visa. I know mm -hmm. we've we've used those two terms yes. um, uh, already. But, you know, just for the benefit of those who might not mm -hmm. fully understand the difference between the two. And there's some people who might actually want an immigrant visa, mm -hmm. but are applying for a non-immigrant visa. There might there might be that confusion as well. So maybe just you know. Yeah, sure. we can give a quick um, overview. So the two. I'm sorry to cut in. If you could also yes. talk about other types of visas, mm. you know, all the subcategories. Okay. Yeah. So uh, non-immigrant visas are the what we're basically talking about here for this hangout. Um, that is where we see the vast majority of our applicants here in Lagos. Those are people who are going for B1, B2, which is the basic tourist temporary visit type of visa. Um, another large category that we have is the student visa. 
And um, I'm sure that a lot of people are watching out there are interested in studying in the United States. We have a lot of student applicants every year. So those are probably the two biggest categories for non-immigrant visas. And what non-immigrant means essentially is that you are only going to stay in the United States for a temporary amount of time. You do not plan to stay there permanently. Mm. Um, there are other classes of non-immigrant visas. Um, we do see some employment visa, non-immigrant visas. Uh, we see some for religious workers. You can find all of that information again on our website um, for the different types of visa classes. If you feel there might be a visa class that um, retains more towards uh, the reason mm -hmm. that you want to visit the United States, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that some of those um, you will have to have someone petition for you. Mm -hmm. um, but all, again, all of that information is available on our website. Uh, immigrant visas are slightly different. These are for individuals who are planning to immigrate to the United States and remain there permanently to live either as a permanent resident, a green card holder as it's called uh, colloquially, or as um, to naturalize and gain U.S. citizenship. And for um, those visa classes, you do have to have an American citizen or a permanent resident in the United States who is petitioning for you mm -hmm. to come join them in the U.S. permanently. Okay. okay, and that, that's a much longer process. Mm -hmm. um, for a non-immigrant visa, anybody can, in a sense, submit an application uh, to the consulate and very quickly be seen by a consular officer and interviewed. Mm -hmm. The immigration process is much longer and starts actually with another agency, uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Okay. Um, and as Katrina was mentioning, you know, that is for someone to, to move to the United States and become an immigrant. And the whole basis for the system is about reunifying families in a sense mm -hmm. and that's why there's this petitioner element um, so if for some, if my child is in the u.s uh, living there permanently legally then that child in certain circumstances can in a sense petition for me to to join them in the united states okay okay well, that makes sense uh, earlier you talked about um, the 160 dollars that needs to be uh, paid for the visa application so you want to tell us about the cost and um, some people would say well if claire is going to tell me no I should better give my money <laughs> so I walk out with my no and my cash uh -huh. in hard Naira. Yeah. So, so tell us, how much does it cost to apply for a visa and can this sum be refunded in the event that the visa is not granted? So I think it's very important to note that we don't consider this fee, this fee is not a fee for a visa. Hmm. It's a fee to apply and be processed appropriately for a visa. Um, and I think that that goes to you know, it's understandable that people are disappointed that they don't get the money back, right? $160 is not a lot of money, but it's significant. Mm. I think that it's important to note that there is a lot of processing, a lot of manpower, so to speak, that goes on behind the scenes. Mm. Uh, all of our staff that works here around the world, uh, you know, we have over 200 posts that issue visas. Wow. Uh, and that that is what it is going to. Um, we're not in the business of, of making money by any means. Mm. We're just looking to, to cover our costs. And additionally, that is segues into another point that you should never feel like you are able to buy a US visa. Mm. You should never pay anyone that says to you, I can oh, yeah. guarantee you a visa. You should never pay anyone that says, I can get you better access. It seems to like this is, this is an important myth to also dispel because yes. we find that there are a lot of travel consultants and people sure. who, uh, you know, try to like help people through the process of applying for a visa and it will almost give them a guarantee and say, hey, sure. if, you, if, you, if you hire me and you pay me this sum, I will sell everything out for you. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say to those sort of people who, who are First, those offering those sort of services, and then second, those who are looking to hire those sort of people. Uh, I mean, I think, Shaylin, you, you've really identified one of the key problems we face at the consulate and, and a problem that our applicants face uh, even more so, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's this, this idea that if someone hires a tout or a coy, as they're called, that their chances for a visa are going to be improved. Uh, we at the consulate, uh, generally speaking, we strongly discourage the use of a tout or a coy in, at any point in the, in the visa application process. Um, these are generally people who, they're not, their primary concern is not getting you a visa, it's rather making money. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the lack of information they have about the process um, and how the visa works and the processing that goes behind it, it can cause a lot of problems for an applicant. Mm. Uh, so again, we, we strongly discourage the use of, of touts and coys and um, really what we encourage is to, for people to go through the whole visa application process on mm. their own mm. 
that will ensure that their, their application is complete, consistent, and that it doesn't raise any red, red flags to the consular officer on the day of interview. I'm actually sure it's possible that there's some people who, if they applied on their own, you know, you know, would be able to get a visa because they have the right information. And the moment they get some advice from some, you know, so-called travel expert, you know, it begins to push them in the wrong direction. They that's, can bungle it. That's exactly right. And those are the most heartbreaking cases when mm. you can tell that someone has a legitimate desire, legitimate ties to Nigeria, and they were mm. so nervous about the process that they felt they needed outside advice, mm. and they're coached in the entirely wrong direction. I like the use of the word coach. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and so it's, and we can tell, right? We're, we see these over a hundred visa sure. interviews a day, we can tell. And it's very important that people come with their authentic story, with why they want to go, uh, and that makes the world a difference. I think one of the reasons that we're doing this Hangout and that we try to uh, reach out to the Nigerian public is to reiterate again and again that um, I think a lot of people feel that the process, the application process for the visa is very complicated and like Patrick was saying, they get nervous about it. Um, but what we're here to tell you is that we tried to make the process as simple as possible so that you can do it yourself. Anyone can uh, go online, go to US Travel Docs after they've paid their um, application fee at any GT bank. They can use that receipt number to go on US Travel Docs, fill out their application, schedule an appointment, and come in on, in on your appointment day. It's that easy. I would have, I would have to say that um, for my own uh, process, I did it myself, and it was, it was straightforward. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm very honest. Um, so I, I can say that I, I'm a, as we, we like to use this word a lot in Nigeria, testimony. Mm. I can testify. <laughs> yeah. I can testify that it's a very simple, straightforward process. Now, questions are coming in already, and we can see uh, some of your questions. Please send, uh, keep sending those questions in. We have uh, about 37 minutes. This is something we do on radio a lot. We always give a time check. <laughs> um, we have about 37 minutes left, so we're going to try and take as many questions as we can. Um, I, and you used the word earlier, ties. Yes. And the first question from Idowu Oluafemi. Idowu, we see you. Thank you uh, for joining the Hangout. Idowu says, I would like uh, the viewer to explain what ties are and mm -hmm. do the ties have hierarchy? Hmm. That's a good question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, you start. Yeah. Okay. You uh, used the word ties. So yeah. Yes, I did. I did. So now I'm I'm caught, uh, so to speak. First of all, I would say that no, I don't think ties have a hierarchy. I don't think that we look first to you know having seven children and then next to making a million naira a month and then next to X. I think that it's it's a holistic picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so, starting with that more specific question and going to the more general, ties are what we as the visa officer uh, use to interpret your motivation to come back to Nigeria. So that's why we ask about jobs, it's why we ask about salaries, about family. But again, there's no hierarchy and there's no exact formula. It's a holistic picture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's important to note there's no magic number for family members, there's no magic number for salary. <laughs> sure. There's nothing that you can do. And again, we see many applicants a day. We have a rough idea of what a realistic salary is. Uh, and so it's important to be honest about what you make. It's also important to know that ties change over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So just because you are a single university student making no income right now does not mean that we will always consider you to have weaker ties mm. to Nigeria, mm. nor is it the case that every single university student has weak ties to Nigeria. Mm. So again, it's very individual, it's a holistic picture, and there are no magic numbers. Mm. Just, just as a follow-up, and I, mm. I mean, when you look at two different applicants, say someone who's, you know, mid-career professional, okay. 40s, 50s, and then you look at someone who's early 20s, obviously their life circumstances are going to be very different. So they're going to have different ties. And in the case of the younger applicant, we may be more concerned with, um, you know, what are your specific intentions mm. for traveling to the U.S.? If a younger applicant um, themselves may have, uh, possibly has weaker ties, we may ask, okay, do you have family members that have, mm. um, you know, traveled to the United States and, and returned to Nigeria? And what does your family situation look like? And, and do you have a strong connection socially and economically to, to Nigeria? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, we recognize that there's diversity and we try as much as possible to take into consideration that diversity. Right. Right. Do you want to add something, Katrina? No, I think my, my colleagues really outlined. But, but I think, I think ties this ties, um, 
uh, this thing about ties is very fundamental to, sure. to this entire process. Um, I, I like the, the phrase motivation to come back to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's safe to, to say that every applicant needs to sufficiently show that there is um, sufficient motivation to come back to Nigeria. Sure. And you, you guys have to be sure about that. Right. Is it, is it safe to make that conclusion? Yeah, I would say we don't even need to be 100% positive. Mm -hmm. We need to be reasonably sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that, because that's important to note because many people also comment that our interviews are very short. Um, <laughs> so we don't need to know everything about you. Uh, you don't need to go off on, on a very detailed speech about your motivations and your ties. Um, we're you're, looking, say, you're, say, you're saying that with a little, uh, yes. you, like, like, you know what, I've heard all kinds of stories. <laughs> <laughs> hear all kinds of things at yep. the interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, I think what something that might be interesting is if we turn around, turn around the question on you, Shannon. Okay. I mean, you're someone who's traveled widely, so I really, mean, am I? Well, I, I know you've been to the U.S. Right? Okay. Well, so I mean, what are the things in your life that that keep you coming back to Nigeria on in those times you've traveled? What are your ties? I mean, the things you guys talked about, pepper soup, pounded yam. <laughs> <laughs> Where else are you going to get pounded yam? <laughs> Where, I mean, we made the best pounded yam. Here, and I could not survive. Anyway, yeah. on a serious note now. Um, well, it's work. It, this, this is where my life is. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love, I'm actually, you guys really turned this on me. Right? <laughs> you successfully turned this on me. No, I don't, I, I'm the one asking the questions. Anyway, but um, I, I'm passionate about Nigeria. I love my country. I, I, this is, this is, where my work is, sure. you know, so I, I could travel the world on holiday, mm -hmm. you know, you know, meet people, have fun, but I need to come back to work. You know, I think you made a fun. really good point when you said, this is where my life is, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's what we are looking for when we interview applicants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are, again, this ties back to the, the length of the interview, like you said, the not needing a lot of documents to come to the interview. We're looking at you as a person. We're looking at the snapshot of the individual. That's what we consider. I have an interesting material. question. A lot of people have, um, you know, people people are very present online. Mm -hmm. You know, so from someone's Twitter feed, you can check them out and see what they're up to. From Instagram page, mm -hmm. from from, from anyone's Instagram page. I, I mean, I do the same. You know, if if I meet someone, I want to check them out, and I really I'm interested in the person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go online and I'm checking the person out to see. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this because we're broadcasting to the, to the whole world. But, I mean, everyone does it. It's not even, it's, I mean, it's not, you Google people, right? right? Is that something you guys do? You know, so like Olu Ashwampi is in front of you. He's a radio host and you're like, Olu oh, Google. Google yeah, and, it, and it just see me, maybe if I tweeted something and I'm like, you know, and you saw something I said on Twitter. And do you guys check that, check all that, you know, as part of like background? No, it's definitely not something that we do. Like, really? You know, with every applicant. No. Okay. No, no. Yeah. So it's not a standard procedure. No. It's, not, it's, not, it's not a box you have checked on Twitter. No. It seems like a normal no, thing. No, we don't do that. <laughs> check Facebook page, check Twitter page. We don't do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we have more questions uh, coming in. Uh, Osamu Diawe Enaholo says, is there a minimum monthly salary one should earn to be eligible for visa to go for a conference? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I actually want to answer an additional question that relates to this. Um, for people who are going to like a business conference or a school conference or a conference really on any subject, um, the type of visa that you'll, you'll be, you be applying for is the same visiting visa, the B1, B2. Okay, so it's a visiting visa, a tourist visa, but it's also a, a person can also do a conference on that visa. Okay, uh, now to get to the, the asker's question, um, no, I mean, we're, we're not looking for a, a certain salary. Really, uh, in the case of someone going to a conference, what me personally, what I'm more concerned about is, does it make sense that this person is going to X conference, you know? Um, for example, uh, does it make sense uh, for, uh, I don't know, like a, a banker to be going to a health conference, right? A banker to go to a conference on nuclear energy or something like that, that, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Mm. And so we want to see a connection with, in most cases, we want to see a connection with the things that the person is doing here in Nigeria, the aspirations they have, um, uh, and their interests and, and, and the conference itself. So there, there should be a, uh, it should make sense, so to speak. So you guys are not seeing, how do you then assess that this individual can can afford, you know, to pay for this trip and can afford to take care of themselves while, while they're in the U.S.? Because you, you said you're not looking at 
bank account uh, mm -hmm. or documents. You know, most a lot of people. I actually came with my bank account, mm -hmm. which, even though I wasn't asked for it. You know, and you're not asked. You're not really seeing or checking how much this person earns monthly. So, how are you able to assess that they can afford the trip? How are you able to make that assessment? It's a good question, um, and I, again, I think it ties back into the similar questions we've had about, you know, how do we assess if we're not looking at any papers and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, what I will say is that, you know, we as officers, we do get a lot of training before we come out to do our job, and mm -hmm. the purpose of the training and what we do is to um, assess it from the interview, from the questions mm -hmm. that we ask. Mm -hmm. um, if you can speak logically about um, what you're going to do and why there's a whole range of indicators that we can look at to um, to assess whether or not we feel that your the purpose of travel as we call it what you say you're going to do in the United States makes sense from what you're telling us all right I, w I would also add that you know we recognize that you know in this context people rely on their families to, mm -hmm. to a large extent. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of social capital tied up in, in families and mm -hmm. someone who may have a, a, a lower salary, it makes sense that they might rely on a an brother uncle, who is more auntie, established yeah. or a parent or mm -hmm. an uncle. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, is that something in, in that this, has to be said at the interview process? Not necessarily, okay. but, but it's something that we recognize in the back of our minds that mm -hmm. you know people do rely on their social capital here mm -hmm. to do things that they would uh, ordinarily not be able to do and that's mm -hmm. perfectly legitimate mm -hmm. so. all right guys we're having a good time here um, this is a special Google hangout where the US consulate uh, here in Lagos Nigeria I've got Patrick Claire and Katrina got that right yes, got that. yes. <laughs> um, and we're, a we're answering your questions remember you can ask a question if you're just joining us um, ask a question using uh, a button that is on the top right corner of your screen it looks something like this just click on it and you'd be able to ask your question. We're, we're sifting through the questions and picking questions that, um, that are sort of like general that you know can help everyone else you know um, attend to the issues that they have. All right. Um, back to you guys now. I know we've we've talked about it already, but just to reiterate, um, we earlier dispelled because when we started, we had about twenty-three uh, people. Now we have about forty-three people who uh, might not have um, seen us um, talk about it. We talked about the greatest myth, mm -hmm. and that has to do with documents. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about the process, the visa application process. So who wants to do a quick recap uh, before we take uh, more questions? Uh, sure. Uh, there are basically four steps uh, to apply for a visa. And again, here we're, we're talking about the typical visiting visa. Um, you, you need to pay your visa service fee at a GT Bank branch or online if you have a, a GT Bank account. Um, Second, you need to use the bank right. account confirmation to yeah, yeah. enter the online application, the DS-160. Mm -hmm. Right. And you also need to fill out the application, which you can find uh, through our website. Uh, the application can be accessed directly at ustraveldocs.com slash ng. And then you'd schedule a time for your interview and, and come in. So four basic steps. It's pretty so, straightforward. So that's ustraveldocs.com ng. Uh, slash ng. Uh, slash ng. <laughs> and, again, and again, there's a there, there's a link in the left hand uh, showcase uh, okay. feature on the on the platform. And then remember the um, the website for uh, the consulate is the www.nigeria.usembassy.gov, and I believe all that information is on there. So earlier we talked about um, um, touts and and uh, you know coaches, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, that help people. And you, you're saying you're discouraging people. From yes, greatly. It's best to come in with your true story, uh, with why you really want to go to the U.S., what your legitimate ties here are to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And again, um, we understand that ties can change over the years, and so your story one time will not automatically disqualify you for the future. But All yes, right. do, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Always better. <laughs> and Claire, Claire, Katrina, and Patrick have told us that they're trained you know, to look at your form, have a conversation with you, and assess you. So those documents, all those Ghana must mm -hmm. go. That you can normally <laughs> come in, please leave the Ghana must go at home. Just calm as you are. <laughs> anyway, um, another question from Osemu. Osemu, I was just um, shorting your name because I don't want to bite my tongue. Osemu Enaholo says, how often are F2 visas refused for, de for dependents, wife and kids of an F1 visa holder and what are common reasons? Mm. So again, how often are F2 visas refused for dependents, wife and kids of an F1 visa holder, mm -hmm. and what are the common reasons? Sure. So just to decode that a little bit, uh, F2 is the shorthand that we use for 
wives and children of student applicants okay. and F1 spouses of children. Yes, yeah, excuse me. Um, so it should be, um, and then the F1 is the student, him or herself. So the we don't have any specific percentage of how often that is, but what we normally uh, look at is the relationship there. Do we think that this is your wife um, that you mm. did not just marry so she could go to the U.S. with you? Um, and are these your, genuinely your kids? Mm -hmm. Those okay. are very okay. simple. So if Patrick were to be a Nigerian, those two cats, would not, <laughs> would not qualify. Unfortunately, right? no. Unfortunately they no. They don't need visas. Oh, they don't need, cats don't need visas, right? No. So I can travel with my dog. I, I would uh, mm. check with the USDA. Yeah. And, and the airline. <laughs> and the airline. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, okay. I just thought about something. I have to move on from that. Um, more questions are coming in. Uh, yeah, we'll take them as we go along. Now, uh, we've also talked about the interview, visa interview coach or consultant. Now, some people are saying there's some legitimate travel agencies. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about coins and touts and fakes, but there are some travel agencies that, that give legitimate, um, you know, sort of advice to people intending to travel. Mm -hmm. So is it safe to say that people shouldn't consult with those sort of like established travel agents and consultants? Mm -hmm. I think again, we would reiterate that we here, we recommend that you fill out your own application and do the whole process on your own. Um, what I can say is that we do, you know, we have groups that come in, you know, for tourist groups that want to travel as a group to the United States and they might have been arranged by a travel agency. You know, people shouldn't feel that they can't go to a travel agency at all. Like if they're wanting to travel as part of a school group, we do have things like that. For special anyone, tours. Yeah, or, special okay. tour. Anyone who's interested in those types of things, we um, we have a group appointment link that's also on our website. So you can see that for more information, how you might qualify as a group to do a tour, things like that. Mm. Um, but in general, we recommend that people fill out their own application. Mm. Yeah, and it's perfectly fine to go to a travel agency for travel purposes. Just mm. don't accept their advice about the U.S. visa list. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, I would add, um, you know, if you do use someone to help fill out the application, mm. just be fully aware of what's being entered into the application on your behalf. Mm. The the mm. submit button, so to speak, should never be pressed unless you know everything that's been put in that application and you're okay with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know we've said a lot about documents, but uh, permit me to go back on that. Um, I know that, and you, you've said it already, but just to reiterate that there's some documents in some specific cases that need to be brought. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just do a quick recap of that? Sure. Um, we talked earlier about the student visa. So anyone who's interested in applying for a student visa to study in the United States, they will need their I-20 form, which mm -hmm. is issued from the school directly to the student, um, basically saying that the student has been enrolled, <coughs> admitted to the school for that particular program. Mm -hmm. So we'll need to see that at the time of the interview. We'll also mm -hmm. need to see the SEVIS uh, confirmation uh, fee payment to show that you paid the SEVIS fee um, at the time of the interview. So you will need those two documents. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's anything else for student visas. Okay. Um, for other, there are other visa classes. Where um, you would require. Right, where you would require um, documentation such as a petition and things like that. But um, for the normal tourist visa. One of the other cases that, uh, in which it is useful to bring in some documentation is when someone is applying on a B1, B2 visa, again, a visiting visa, mm -hmm. but their specific intention is to have some kind of medical procedure done. Okay. Mm -hmm. In okay. those kinds of cases, you know, it is helpful to um, see, for example, correspondence with a medical facility of some kind or confirmation of your appointment. Um, you know, something that can corroborate that you're, you're going to the United States specifically for this purpose. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, we really want to understand or, or we really want to, to make sure that this medical procedure that you're going for that, you know, is, is you can afford it. Mm -hmm. um, so in those cases, we sometimes do ask more questions about monthly incomes and those kinds of things. Okay. Okay. Well, if you um, have missed parts of this um, hangout, we can say that it will be available after the hangout on YouTube. Uh, it's, it will be there permanently so you can uh, watch it again, share it with your friends and, and um, you know, preach the gospel. All right. Now we have a, we have a question and 
this question you know, speaking about a particular case and as we said earlier we might not be able to address particular uh, cases however i would paraphrase and, and pick out you know a, a general question from it so if there's been any form of error mm. on you know a passport for instance and you know that an individual an applicant uses that uses that passport to make an application mm -hmm. and it's turned down for any reason and corrections are made on uh, that passport and it's represented for another application um will, will, what is what are the what are the chances that that person gets a visa would would uh, would there be any problem with that mm -hmm. i think it, it it all depends on how significant the difference is mm -hmm. i mean if if some person comes in one day for an interview and they say my name is you know so and so and six months down the line they come in and say they're someone totally different and they have a new passport which raises a question of how they got that passport uh, that's a that's a very material um, difference mm. but if it's the switching of say the the month and day uh, on on the passport for the date of birth mm -hmm. that's something that you know we look at on a case-by-case -case basis and and try to assess is this is this a material difference mm -hmm. um, you know big differences in dates of birth on one application versus another one, say like 10 years, that might be a material difference. Okay. But in most cases, you know, we understand, you know, we're not, we're not perfect as humans and mm, um, absolutely. people at various agencies, they, it's possible to, to enter in someone's information incorrectly and result in a document that is, does not reflect reality. So mm. we understand that. Mm. Do you want is, is Katrina or Claire want to add anything? No, thank All right. You. There's a question here. Um, how does how do you guys determine that an applicant is not in um, in fact an intending immigrant, and how does someone overcome that presumption? That's great because that goes to the heart of what we're doing as visa officers. Mm. So Katrina outlined earlier the difference between non-immigrant and immigrant visas, and one of the basic qualifications for a non-immigrant visa is for you to be a non-immigrant, mm -hmm. so not intending to immigrate. Mm -hmm. What we do is we ask questions about your purpose of travel and we ask questions about your ties. So we talked about ties earlier, right? No magic number, it's a holistic picture. Why you want to come back to Nigeria is your life in Nigeria, mm -hmm. as Katrina mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then purpose of travel, we ask for purpose of travel to not only make sure that we're giving you the right classification of visa, okay. but also to make sure that you are going for a specific purpose and not just to go to get to the United States and make a new life for mm -hmm. yourself there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we ask for details about vacation plans. That's why we ask for more details about conferences. Mm -hmm. We want to understand why you are going to the US for this period of time. Uh, and so those are really the the two things that we're looking for for you to overcome the intending immigrant presumption. Fantastic. All right, Idowu Oluwafemi on uh, the platform has asked a question. He says, I've heard a lot of stories about people denied visas because a family member has applied for uh, the immigrant visa and was denied. Can you shed more light on this? Well, um, I'm not quite sure from the question if the if the asker is saying that a family member did not was not approved for an immigrant visa so someone or? so someone applies for uh, for uh, an immigrant visa uh -huh. is denied sure. the immigrant visa and then other members of the family uh, uh, then apply and are denied so he said he's, he said he has heard a story like that before okay um, I mean I think yeah. this question uh, if the if the asker is is asking about whether you know a person has been let's say a person has been petitioned by a family member to become an immigrant right mm -hmm. uh, in the past or recently or or whatever um and then later down the line they come in for a non-immigrant visa mm -hmm. you know that's that's a case where again we we really want to assess does this person in fact intend to return to nigeria mm -hmm. and we recognize that there is such a thing as dual intent so someone may have an intent to immigrate either currently in their in the past but they still intend to uh, follow the letter of the law and return to nigeria mm -hmm. that's possible that's that's dual intent and, and we recognize that's a thing mm -hmm. so again we we really want to get back to what we've mentioned a couple times before what are these person what is this person's ties to nigeria mm -hmm. and in this case do they intend to to return to nigeria mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do just want to mention um, for individuals who are applying for immigrant visas and non-immigrant visas, we are one section. You know, we do 
both types of interviews. Okay. And I'm not saying that this person was necessarily getting at this aspect of it, but it's important to note, if the visa officer assesses that you fraudulently represented yourself in an immigrant visa interview, sure. you will that will transfer over to the non-immigrant visa process, and mm -hmm. we will look very seriously at that I just, during I just, the application. I just thought about so. the, the craziest, craziest idea, right? What? Um, I like the I like the fact that Patrick talked about dual intent earlier. Yeah. So it occurred to me, what if someone genuinely, illegally presented themselves? All right, so the mm -hmm. person had an illegal intent or had a fraudulent intent. You sure. know, wanted to, you know present themselves in a certain light because they wanted to go to the US. Mm -hmm. And how about if two or three years down the line, this person actually genuinely turns around and is a, you know, turned a new leaf and, you know, now maybe has a proper job, um, you know, um, is, you know, earning a proper income and is a responsible citizen mm -hmm. and really just wants to travel on holiday. Will their past sins? <laughs> That's a great question. That's a really good question. Because yeah. individuals pass scenes yeah. yeah. visited on them. Yeah. I think that this is another big myth. Mm -hmm. um, every, in this case, if you're talking about someone who has genuinely turned over a new leaf, then it's on the, we will take a little bit more time. So okay. it won't be a three minute interview. Okay. We will ask you questions about what were your motivations? Um, you know, why? We're trying to get at the sense of why this person may have turned over this new leaf. Is this new leaf genuine and things like that. <laughs> so I will say that for people who have genuinely made a shift in their life, there is an opportunity. Um, but we will also say that we have a lot of people who say that they have turned over a new leaf and that is not necessarily the case. Okay. So, and you're um, trained to, to be able to spot, to be able to spot mm -hmm. those. And like Claire said, we do recognize that um, your your situation can change over time. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's been a while since the last time you came in for an interview and maybe you were denied at that time. Mm -hmm. um, your situation could have changed and that's what we're looking to mm -hmm. assess. What is your situation now mm -hmm. that uh, we have reasonable, we can reasonably assume that you're not intending to, to immigrate to the United States? Okay, okay, that makes sense. Now, you, you guys talked about um, travel history earlier, and I think Patrick mentioned it briefly. Um, a lot of people think that prior travel mm. is, is absolutely necessary before getting a U.S. visa. Do you want to talk about this? I think that's a fantastic question because I also think this is one of the big myths that uh, is out there that, you know, people will get automatically denied if they don't have any uh, travel history. I've heard it be called like a virgin passport, like you know, <laughs> nothing in the passport, no stamps, anything. Um, and that is, that's absolutely untrue. It's not necessarily true that somebody is going to be denied just because they've never traveled outside of Nigeria before. Um, travel history is one of the many things that we may look at in uh, determining and assessing your ties to Nigeria. Somebody who has traveled before um, for whatever purpose, it may be a good indicator that they, um, you know, that they've done this before, right? They've said they were going to a conference in Europe and they went and they came back. And so now they're going for a conference in the U.S. It, it might be a good indicator that they're going to use the visa as they say that they will. But it's not necessary. It's not imperative that you've traveled somewhere before, mm -hmm. before you come to apply for a U.S. visa. It's one of, as Katrina is saying, it's one of many factors we look at. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, I'll t I take a little bit uh, different angle on this and, and touch on another point that we've discussed. And that's, you know, if someone doesn't have any travel um, history, uh, people should be, uh, we do see cases where people come in and present a passport that has been altered. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we see fake visa stamps. Mm -hmm. And I think in some cases, uh, these stamps are being put in by a tout or a coy. Mm -hmm and that can seriously damage the credibility of an applicant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have any travel history, just, you know, be upfront about it. Don't don't try to, you know, suggest that you have travel history that you actually don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, in the case of a refusal, is there an opportunity for, um, you know, for an applicant to uh, appeal to a high authority, you know, just send an email to, okay, probably that would have been a good joke, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, is, there, is there a possibility to apply to a high authority, maybe by email, possibly? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, a person can access it via private email. I still crack the joke, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the consular officer's decision in an individual visa application, that is, in a sense, the, the final word on that application. Mm. Um, people are welcome to apply and reapply at any point they want. 
But what I would say is, is people should assess, uh, they should ask themselves the question, uh, you know, have my life circumstances significantly changed from my last application? Hmm. If the answer is yes, then, um, you know, and, and you think it, your life circumstances have changed in a way that would positively affect your, your chances for a visa, then, you know, that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. But if you apply, you know, one day and 90 days later, you're reapplying and the basic life circumstances have not changed in any way, someone may, may want to, to question whether, it, you know, that's a good, a good time to submit another application. Mm -hmm. um, so even in the case of a refusal, we will still reconsider the case when a new application is put in down the line. So what timeline are we looking at? We generally recommend that people wait at least 90 days before they uh, make a fresh application to come in for interview. However, like Patrick said, if um, it, it's not a sense of, okay, I wait three months and then I'll apply again and come in. If nothing has really changed about your life circumstances, um, you know, it might be, it might behoove the applicant to think a little bit more about, you know, is this the right time to spend all that money and apply again? Sure. I, know, I, I know that you guys are very well trained and, and you guys do an excellent job and it's a very difficult job, I, I must admit, but you guys are doing a great one at it. Um, but what are the chances that, you know, uh, a council officer is having a bad day and, you know, just having a headache, Claire is not just in the mood, and then this guy just walks in and she just doesn't like his face. Mm -hmm. And the guy actually believes that he's, I mean, I, there's every reason why I should get this visa, and maybe there's some emergency or something, mm -hmm. and he's denied, right? In those sort of cases where the applicant feels strongly that, hey, I don't think I was dealt fairly with here, mm -hmm. is there an avenue for that individual to at least be heard and make an application? Right, and that's why we say that we recommend 90 days, but we will never restrict an applicant from reapplying with the same circumstances. Okay. So if you genuinely feel as if you were not given a fair shake at your visa interview, and we will freely admit we are human, mm -hmm. um, that you will, you are more than welcome to come in for another interview. Mm -hmm. What we will take into consideration, however, is the prior, is the officer's prior decision. Mm -hmm. So the 90 day guideline is for you to have a change in your circumstances. If you apply before then, what we're going to look at is, okay, this applicant applied in the exact same circumstances and the decision mm -hmm. was different. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will, Review That's that. what we will take into consideration. All right. Uh, Falasha De Adigoyega has asked the question. And uh, uh, the question is, when there is a refusal during the interview, why doesn't the applicant get the exact reason for the refusal? Uh, they usually hand the slip that just states general and vague refusal reasons. Uh, this doesn't help the applicant in case he or she wants to reply. Mm -hmm. So I think the first issue here is, do you guys, um, um, this person is saying that the, um, the, the statement is vague on refusal reasons? Um, so it's it may seem vague, but it's actually the exact statute of the Immigration and Naturalization Act mm -hmm. under which we are making that decision. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's actually very specific and pertinent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's 214B, and that is that you did not overcome the presumption that you are an intending immigrant, mm -hmm. um, or that the, we do not believe that the purpose of travel that you have presented is appropriate for the visa class to which you applied. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems like it's a very broad umbrella, mm -hmm. um, but the way that our law is, is that that's actually only one of, of several different ways that someone could be refused a visa. Okay. Um, so it's important to note that the reason why that letter is the way it is is because it's that specific statute uh, that we are making the determination mm. under. Okay. Okay, do you want to add to that? Or? Uh, no, I, I mean, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's a great answer. That's a okay, I have a question here. Um, now, is there any procedure through which an applicant is not required to be interviewed? Uh, mm -hmm. by a consular officer. So under what conditions would an applicant seeking either renewal or seeking a visa not be interviewed if they're the president? So the, um, <laughs> the what you're talking about here with this question, the most common type uh, where we will waive the visa or the, the interview, interview is um, for somebody who has had a previous visa, uh, for the tourist visa category, I believe it's within the last two years, right? Mm -hmm. So the last, if your visa you've had a previous visiting visa and it's expired within the last 24 months, um, you may be eligible for what is called our Dropbox Visa Renewal Program. And what that basically is, is you will send it, you will fill out the application, pay the, uh, the fee, 
do everything that you normally would do for an interview, except instead of coming in to the consulate for an interview, you can send your passport and the application um, via one of our DHL offices, and we will do an automatic renewal of the, well, it's not automatic per se, but we will do a, we will waive the interview for the renewal of the visa. So, so, so it's not an automatic, it's not so, an automatic. It's, so it's not, you're not guaranteed to get a visa, you're not guaranteed to get a renewal. It's not guaranteed that you will get the visa without the interview, okay? okay. Um, for, there may be various reasons that we may ask applicants to come back and appear for an interview before mm -hmm. we reissue the visa. Okay. Um, but you, you know, you can fill out, you can go on uh, online and s go through the steps to see if you are eligible for mm -hmm. Dropbox, which is what we call it. And if you are, um, then you can go that route, and your interview will be waived most likely. Okay, there's another question here that says, in cases of visa, I mean, you've addressed it a bit, but I, I believe this this would, um, you know, unveil a, a bit more detail with regards to the act that you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, how can the applicant find out why they were denied a visa? And then there's a certain section 214B mm -hmm. yes. that, that is, that, you know, needs some, you know, some, a little... Um, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I, the... I don't want to recommend that people go online and read the INA, the Immigration and Naturalization <laughs> Act, because even if you are a lawyer, it is obtuse in a very special kind of way. Oh, wow. uh, the, the statute that is very important um, is 214B, uh, and that is the statute that talks about uh, what people are eligible for specific types of non-immigrant visas. Um, and we want to be sensitive to applicants, uh, and we want to be able to give them a constructive interview, but we also don't want to tell them that there's a magic bullet that will make mm. them automatically eligible for a visa the next time they come in. Mm. Uh, because we don't want to say, oh, go to Ghana twice, and then you'll be eligible, <laughs> right? Because that's not fair, not only to the next officer who has to deal with that case, but to the applicant who is laboring under a false, uh, a, a false impression that they're going mm. to be eligible. Mm. So the reason, um, we give this letter that gives the exact statute is that so people are aware of the, the legal basis for the decision, mm. um, but also because there is no way that we could guarantee anyone a visa in their next interview. Mm. Um, and it also goes, uh, it's worth mentioning, I think, that we're legally prohibited from giving more specific reasons. Oh, okay. So it's not just American visa officers sitting up there and saying, oh, we're, uh, we're very mean and, uh, and we we're very not friendly. Um, it's because we are legally prohibited from discussing specifics of your case. Of your case. Yep. Fantastic. Now, I would have to appeal uh, to you guys that we do this you know, sometime again soon and possibly focus on student visas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so po possibly you know, target this at students yeah. and say intending students uh, you know, for both uh, you know, undergraduate and postgraduate programs should listen in uh, you know, for this, this course targeted at them because we unfortunately weren't able to answer questions directly about the student visa. Sure. But we have a, about a minute, uh, less than a minute, and maybe mm -hmm. I'll just allow us quickly talk about student sure. visas. On, I mean, We've talked about visas generally, but are there any specific details with regards to student visas that we need to touch on before we leave? Yeah, I think so. Um, Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think the, uh, the biggest thing that differentiates a normal tourist visa from a student visa is, um, you know, the purpose of travel is more or less evident, right? We know that you want to study at a specific institution in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're looking for in the interview, we want to see uh, why you chose this particular school, what you plan to study. Um, we want to see how it fits into your previous educational history and your overall career goals or what you see for yourself as a future. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, the things that we're really looking at during the interview. Mm -hmm. We want to assess your student intent. Are you really going to go to the United States and study as you say you will? All right, and Bank Kohli, uh, Majestan, just quickly sent a question in. How many admission letters must one have in the U.S. before he or she can come uh, for a student visa interview or apply for a student visa? That's a great question, and I think it's important to make the distinction between admissions let and admission letters and I-20 forms. Mm -hmm. I-20 is the piece of paper you need to uh, apply for a student visa to the U.S., in addition to that SEVIS Pay, uh, payment that we were talking about earlier, the two hundred dollars. So admission letters, we don't we don't necessarily need to see an admission letter because you can't get an I twenty form without having been admitted to the school. Mm. Um, so I twenty forms, you need 
one to come in for the interview. Just one? Uh, yes, you need to have made the selection of what school you would like to attend. Um, that school will be noted in your visa, and um, that, that's what we're looking for. So. I mean, we're really excited by all the, 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 the huge number of Nigerians that are interested in mm -hmm. studying in the United States, and mm -hmm. we do offer some resources here at the consulate and at the embassy in Abuja for uh, students who, who want to study in the U.S. We run a program called the Education USA Advising Center, mm -hmm. and you can find more information about that on our website under the resources section. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's a, it's a resource center to which people can come and, and research schools, get individual advising sessions on you know, all the accredited universities in the United States. Mm. Um, and it's, it's open to anybody on Wednesdays, mm. and on the other days it's open to members. Mm -hmm. All right, so this will be my final question, guys. Final, final question, <laughs> about injury time. Can uh, a student work in the U.S. with mm -hmm. a student visa? That's a great, great question. Um, and there are some intricacies, so you, if you are interested in working in the U.S. while you're on a student visa, you want to make sure that you get all of the information um, and so that you do it correctly and uh, you don't jeopardize your student status while you're in the U.S. Um, so the short answer is yes, there are some uh, scenarios in which students can work while they're studying in the United States. If you're working on um, campus, like at a campus cafe, something like that, um, you can do that on a student visa. Uh, the limit is you can't work more than 20 hours per week. Mm. If you're interested in working off campus, um, like working, you know, doing an internship or working at a restaurant in town, something like that to make some extra money, um, you may also be able to do that, but there'll be extra authorization that you need to get from USCIS, right? Correct. Um, and then no, no, the form. Uh, US Citizenship <laughs> and Immigration <laughs> Services, sorry. Okay. Um, so you will have to get extra authorization from them. And uh, I think you can find that information on our website. Um, there's a certain form that you have to fill out to be authorized to work while you're studying. And again, it's still only 20 hours a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So uh, that, that is it. The Google Hangout special one here live from the U.S. Consulate General here in Lagos has been a fantastic one. A big thank you to everyone who joined in. I think at the peak we hit uh, about 50 uh, uh, viewers, so a big thank you to you all. If we weren't able to answer your question, um, uh, apologies that we weren't able to get to you. Now, finally, uh, information uh, for people to stay in touch. Uh, we've talked about the website, ustraveldocs.com. Uh, forward slash ng. Uh, remember, is also the Nigeria dot us embassy dot gov. Mm -hmm. See, I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it. Um, thank you so much, Patrick. Sure. Uh, it was it was nice to to thank speak you. to you, and Katrina. Yes. And again, a uh, big thank you to the uh, uh, consulate management for this opportunity. Um, to be here and to host this um, Google Hangout. Yeah. And, look forward to more. And sorry for interrupting. If you do have additional questions, please feel free to use the hashtag AskTheVOs, and we'll try and address them either in future Hangouts, hopefully, yeah. uh, or via our social messaging sites. All right, and so. we do have some upcoming events. Uh, we're continuing our, our public outreach. So I know that we have a couple upcoming events specifically about student visas that are going to take place at a couple universities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so connect with us on Twitter or like our Facebook page um, to get more information about the upcoming events that we have if you have more questions or want to learn more about Fantastic. applying for visas in the U.S. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. And signing out, Uluwashi P of Nigeria Info 99.3 from God bless. See you again.